How are you, everyone? You okay? Amazing. Hello, everyone. Um, we are extremely excited to be here on KubeCon and talk about the second major version of remote write protocol in the Prometheus ecosystem. And I have to admit, in a really context of distributed systems, I personally have some, some kind of weakness or respect towards network protocols and, and APIs. And I would love to learn if you have the same feelings, but to me, designing network protocols for high volume data, especially in open source, poses a lot of interesting questions. How to make this API extensible, but also stable. How to make it flexible and powerful, but also simple, efficient, and consistent. Plus, it takes really years to get it adopted and get feedback of whatever you change. Um, and also, you have to think about you know, common network problems and distributed system problems, challenges like consistency and availability. Um, so let's start with a short introduction to the Prometheus remote write protocols. So primary, primary role of Prometheus, if you're not familiar, is to allow you to instrument, collect, store, and query all your metrics, and then do some kind of work on top of that, for example, alerting, dashboarding, and so on. However, if you are familiar with Prometheus a bit more, you know that Prometheus also comes with those remote storage interfaces. So why? And literally from the beginning of Prometheus, the developers like Julius Foltz, 11 years ago, um, issue number 10, like very, very beginning when I was looking at it, um, were thinking on how Prometheus can integrate with, you know, remote, uh, well, like different databases. And back then, there wasn't much there. Um, I, I found that uh, there were mentions about InfluxDB integration, OpenTSDB. Um, but still, such need for remote, write, uh, remote storage integration shouldn't come as a surprise if you are familiar with Prometheus. Um, Prometheus was, and still is, a single node solution after all. No built replication, no built clustering or so on by design. This is why the younger protocol, Remote Read, was introduced so any client can ask for some historical raw metric samples in Prometheus format. For example, initially it was, an, it was to enable PromQL uh, query language and, and querying capabilities through Prometheus against metrics stored in a different databases like in OpenTSDB. It wasn't long until read API, the same read API, was also exposed on Prometheus itself, right? Allowing long-term storage solutions like Thanos to effectively query Prometheus for the fresh metrics or raw data in Prometheus format, or for proxies like Promxy um, to transparently deduplicate and, you know, and hide high availability replicas of Prometheus. However, probably the most nowadays used remote integration is the older remote write protocol. It allows any client to um, send metric samples in Prometheus format from one place to another, typically live streaming fresh metrics to centralized long-term storage. Uh, similar to read, Prometheus also supports receiving the same uh, protocol, remote write request, so you can import really any metrics uh, from other places to Prometheus. Now, in May um, this year, Prometheus team released a new experimental version of remote write protocol called 2.0. And we, with Callum, had the pleasure to co-author that version. Um, so in this talk, I would like you to know why remote write 2 exists, uh, what it enables, and how we improved efficiency of, of the whole protocol on the way despite more features, and how you can use it in production right now in Prometheus, and perhaps adopt in your tools integration. But before that, short intro introduction. Um, I'm here with Callum. Yeah, uh, hi everyone, my name is Callum. I'm an engineer at Grafana Labs. Uh, I maintain remote write. I've been doing that for four-ish years now, I wanna say. Um, so I'm a Prometheus team member, and uh, I've been involved in protocol type stuff basically since university. Uh, my first internship, I reverse engineered and re-implemented ADB for Android, if anybody's heard from that. Um, outside of engineering stuff, I spend most of the time just relaxing with my girlfriend and my two dogs, uh, and I'm pretty happy I've managed to every day so far this year, including today, uh, keep up with studying Japanese. Yeah. My name is Bartek Botka, and I work at Google. I'm a tech lead for Google Cloud Managed Service for Prometheus. Um, I'm also Prometheus maintainer, Thanos maintainer. Um, I maintain many Golang, mostly Golang libraries uh, in open source. I, I love um, Golang and, and generally programming. I'm active in the CNCF. I wrote a book called Efficient Go, which is about Golang and optimizations. Um, and also in my free time, I recently am doing more uh, adventure motorcycling, which is not always end up well, ending up well, as you can see, but that's why it's called adventure. Um, okay. 
So you know Remote Ride has a new version, right? Let's dive on why this even happened. Um, how is the second version you know, helping Prometheus and, and you and users? Um, to answer this, let's take a look on the history again. Almost exactly eight years ago, Prometheus merged an MVP of the Remote Ride protocol leveraging the gRPC framework. The protocol was extremely simple and generic. Uh, it was generally a stateless protobuf request with unstructured labels and corresponding samples sent in order, nothing else. Later, the gRPC dependency was removed as the HTTP2 and uh, transfer protocol and the gRPC framework was, were literally just released 2015. So many you know, cloud providers didn't even support, uh, support it. Uh, for example, cloud provider load balancers. Uh, and also, remote write protocol semantics wasn't really benefiting, benefiting of a, from unique HTTP2 you know, gRPC features. And it looks like this simplification uh, really was a good bet. Uh, because organically, through years, remote write got pretty impressive adoption. It allowed people to integrate uh, with various solutions and other monitoring systems, vendors, and tools. Um, it enabled new long-term storage uh, solutions to be created even, right? It kind of started a, a mini industry with those uh, cloud-managed Prometheus uh, services popping everywhere, integrating with existing Prometheus setups and helping everyone. Overall, it became, remote write became an important open source standard, and all of this with a single protobuf file, no official specification, actually, or even version, pure organic grow and adoption. And eventually it was kind of ridiculous, right? So only a year ago, uh, we finally released the official remote write one specification that was kind of like retro specification following a common RFC format, and it uh, outlined important protocol details uh, beyond protocol format, right? So also retry semantics, backward compatibility, and so on. And really it was essential to, to even talk about any major improvements uh, to the protocol, right? The point is, I'm trying to share here is that one zero remote ride we use nowadays is exactly the same as one eight years ago. And it's really both amazing and scary at the same time, right? It's really impressive because, you know, that it didn't need to change a lot and allow such stability and adoption, but also scary because, you know, ev ecosystem evolved and there are new capabilities and features that would be nice to have there. And the second point to realize is that eight years ago, Prometheus team decided that um, to keep the both PromQL language and remote write format close to the Prometheus storage format, right? As opposed to maybe taking some other formats, exposition format, maybe InfluxDB, you know, replication format, whatever. It, and, and this decision to tie into storage allowed the least amount of overhead when used with Prometheus, which, which allowed seamless integration. But also, as a kind of interesting consequence, we forced remote storages like, you know, like, like even vendors or, or open, in open source to adapt organically uh, and spreading for better or worse Prometheus simpler and flexible Prometheus, you know, schema-less format patterns uh, to the wider ecosystem and users. Um, and however, you know, you might notice that Prometheus storage, you know, constantly evolves. This week we are releasing Prometheus 3.0, and you can join the session tomorrow about that, um, which expands on beyond, beyond the original capabilities, you know, so many years ago. And as a result, we have some gap between what Prometheus storage offers and what our protocol uh, offered. For example, Prometheus team designed a new native histograms that give us more efficient, um, you know, flexible, accurate, and structured histograms. And recently, we ex extended that um, to also support custom buckets, so which allows literally replacing classic histograms in place um, for efficiency and transaction transactionality. Uh, for some time, we have also exemplars, which allow metrics to link to other observability signals like traces. Um, Prometheus already have uh, and stores metadata, um, which allow you to quickly access help, type, and unit of your metrics. Incredibly useful to integrate with more type, typed remote storages, as well as, you know, like have a powerful UI that auto-completes your metrics and, and allows you to discover your metrics. Um, finally, created timestamp. Um, this feature allows to improve uh, rates and accuracy of rates and generally uh, counters, and especially for short-lived um, time series. For example, like you know, serverless jobs and batches, those push-based push metrics. And finally, UTF-8. Um, so you know that that Prometheus already supports in Free Zero for compatibility with other metric solutions and generally non-English um, people. All of those 
reasons where were really solid solid reasons to kind of motivate us to really look on the you know next version of remote storage um, that will take advantage of those features. Now, of course, Prometheus team wasn't just lazy and like forgetting about this protocol. Uh, in fact, if you go to the current protobuf file 1.0, uh, you see a lot of experimental fields which are not covered by the official 1.0 spec. And um, this was extremely, extremely useful for development of this next version because you know when you notice um, in the closer ecosystem of Prometheus, all those projects like Cortex, uh, Thanos, and Mimir, all of those use these experimental fields, kind of YOLO fields, uh, but we, we kind of to enable those new features early and test them and develop. Um, so we really gather a lot of data and production data on certain decisions, especially around metadata that Callum will explain later. So with that, we were ready to start thinking about the next version of Remote Right. Uh, right, so Bartek is a, a little bit ahead of what actually happened, right? So we eventually had all of these ideas of things that for sure should go into Remote Right, but the idea of uh, making changes to the protocol format actually started a bit earlier. I'll go into some, some detail there. But uh, it's good to keep in mind that we had some pretty uh, like high-level goals that we wanted to maintain that we had from Remote Write version 1 for Remote Write version 2, um, the most important of which is that we want the protocol to be stateless. We want it to be as easy as possible for both senders and receivers to implement and for receivers, for example, to not have to cache a whole bunch of data because the protocol is uh, stateful in some way. So um, we're basically doubling down on that decision. We're keeping all of the same high-level requirements, high-level goals that we had uh, eight years ago. <clears throat> So uh, the quick story, um, Remote Write 2 basically started as a hackathon project at Grafana Labs. Um, so about two years ago, I took a week during one of our hackathons, and I knew that, for some reasons I'll get into in a bit, um, there were some inefficiencies in the protocol format. Um, basically, we were uh, duplicating a lot of data via Prometheus's label model. Um, and I wanted to see if I could make some changes there and then benchmark whether or not there was any performance improvements. And at Grafana Labs, as part of these hackathons, we actually record demo videos. It's basically a requirement to record a video and, and submit it, and people can watch those. Um, I don't remember, I think Mike came in second or something like that. Uh, but as part of that, lots of other people at the company saw this video, right? And other engineers within the company were interested in this project. They came to me, can I work on this with you? And so eventually we get to uh, a full-fledged project, right? Grafana Labs engineers, Prometheus open source team members, uh, people from community projects like Thanos, OpenTelemetry, stuff like that. Um, and it's, it's a full-fledged project, right? We've got a Slack channel, we have a bioleakly sync call, um, and really without, have, have, without having had turned this into a like, open source project as a community, um, we wouldn't have been as successful as we were here, right? We really needed the input from other implementations of Remote Write um, in order for Remote Write 2 to be successful. So that's how we got to where we are. So what does 2.0 actually do, right? What does it uh, do better than 1.0? One of the main things we wanted to solve for was this pain point of partial writes. So right now in 1.0, if you send a Remote Write request, all you get back is a response 200 that says, hey, I accepted everything, or an error saying, I didn't like something. Right? But there's no indication of whether or not it accepted some of the data or what pieces of data it didn't accept, right? And so uh, in 2.0, we wanted to make that clear. We wanted to have better definitions around what a partial write is, uh, what a success is, and uh, what retry scenarios there are and how the receiver should be able to uh, handle those. So um, there's these new headers that basically, you can think of them almost like a checksum, right? If you send 100 samples and you get back a response that says, I accepted 99, then you know that at least one wasn't accepted, right? Uh, next up, um, as Bartek mentioned, there's a whole bunch of new features in Prometheus itself that were either experimental in the 1.0 format or just not supported at all. Um, so we're supporting native histograms now in, in this uh, protocol format. Uh, we're explicitly allowing for UTF-8 characters, which Prometheus is going to allow for as well. Um, and then one of the main ones is histograms. So if you know about Prometheus's classic histogram format, essentially every bucket in the histogram is a separate time series. The new native histograms bundle those all together into one. 
Um, with classic histograms, some receivers would run into issues where some of the series would be split across write requests, right? Um, half the buckets were in one write request and the other half would be in the next one. We wanted to solve for that problem. We know that issue is particularly problematic for, for example, like the OTEL community. Um, and as part of that, we have these native histograms with uh, custom buckets, which allows for that translation from a classic histogram to a native histogram within the protocol format itself. Uh, the next issue we wanted to deal with was metadata. Um, and as Bartrex mentioned, with metadata we mean like the metrics unit, its actual type, the help text, created timestamp, stuff like that. Uh, in 1.0, metadata is problematic because Prometheus itself was only storing metadata in like this in-memory cache. So the scrape system would come along, look at all your targets, gather the metrics, and then cache the metadata that it had seen in memory. And that actually meant that if two targets had the same metric name, but different semantic meanings for those metrics and different metadata, we'd only store what was scraped most recently, right? And so when remote write goes to send that, you're gonna end up with your receiver receiving the incorrect metadata for at least one of your metrics. We wanted to solve for this as well. And it's also important to mention that we decided that because there was only this metadata cache, we were always gonna send metadata over remote write separately from all your other data. So on a timer, on like, let's say once a minute, we go and look at that cache, remote write grabs all the metadata, sends it all at once. It's not part of the regular um, sharding and upscaling, if you're familiar with that. <clears throat> um, so the reason we need to make a change here is that remote write actually gathers all the data that it's gonna send from Prometheus's write ahead log. And without the metadata in the write ahead log, we couldn't do it. So um, now, uh, with a feature flag, metadata is written to the write ahead log, remote write can gather it, and it can put it into the actual remote write request alongside each sample, right? And so for every sample you're receiving with remote write 2.0, you're gonna get the correct metadata. And so you might be wondering like, hey, earlier you mentioned that you wanted to make this thing more efficient, but you're adding all these features, there's probably more overhead now, it's less efficient, right? Um, in some sense, yes, like obviously there is more overhead with more features, but my original main goal was to reduce the actual payload size, right? Reduce the number of bytes sent over the wire, and sending fewer bytes is a good thing, right? You're either getting billed for that or uh, spending CPU time serializing data, something like that, right? Um, so at the top here, you can see an example of some metrics, and you'll notice that a lot of the key value pairs for labels are the same, right? There's job equals foo, job, job equals bar. There's a lot of duplicates, right? And so <clears throat> we basically borrowed from Prometheus itself, borrowed from like a dictionary type format, uh, and we're doing what we call a symbol table, which is essentially a string interning of all of the string data that goes into the remote write request. And so on the bottom now, you can see we basically have this table that says, for each series, this is the index to reference to get the string that actually matters, right? Um, and one question we heard a lot was, why did you actually opt to do string interning instead of something else? Why not just use, for example, a more efficient compression algorithm, right? Uh, remote write uses Snappy, which is pretty fast, but doesn't compress as well as something like Z standard. And we actually spent a lot of time investigating other compression algorithms, I think a month or two at least, um, doing different experiments. Um, one of the main problems with changing off of something like Snappy is we, we specifically chose Snappy because of its low resource cost, low CPU cost, et cetera, right? Um, and having a better, higher compression ratio from something like Z standard requires more CPU time to be spent on, um, on that serialization and, and encoding in the first place, right? So ultimately, after a bunch of months of experimentation, we found the best win for us was to focus on reducing the payload size itself through string interning, and then these smaller payloads, still using Snappy, are already taking less time to compress and decompress, allocating less bytes when they do so. Um, and that includes when we're using all these new features. So um, we're still using Snappy. We might go back to experimenting with other compressions right now, but <clears throat> the real question that you're probably wondering is like, how much are we actually doing that's better, right? How much better are we? Um, so thankfully, Bartek, put together some benchmarking automation. Um, it's 
uh, using a, basically a tool to generate scrape data sets. Um, and then we're uh, configuring Prometheus with different um, batch sizes, which is the number of data samples uh, in each payload. And so the graphs that I'm going to show you on the next couple of slides, uh, they're looking at three different measurements. The actual message size in bytes on the wire, right? So that remote write request itself. Serialization CPU time, which includes uh, serialization into protobuf as well as encoding uh, via compression, right? We're taking the Go structure, turning it into the bytes that we can send over the wire. And then the amount of bytes that are actually allocated during that serialization process, right? Which obviously contributes to something like garbage collection. <clears throat> it's important to know that in all three of these measures in every graph, a lower number is better. Uh, blue is 1.0, red is 2.0. So in this first set of graphs, we're comparing Prometheus Remote Write 1.0 with none of those extra features we talked about, right? Just that base version that we had eight years ago to Remote Write 2.0 with all of the features. And so for that default payload size of 2,000 samples, um, you can see that we have a slight increase in the payload size. It's not that much, right, 7%. But um, probably a, a fair comparison is actually to turn some of these features on, right? So when we turn on all those optional features, native histograms, metadata, all that kind of stuff, um, it's pretty obvious. Uh, we have nearly a 50% reduction in the wire bytes, right? Um, over 60% reduction in serialization CPU time, uh, and over 80% reduction in bytes allocated during that serialization. But there's actually one more feature that we can turn on to make this even, even better, right? Which is those native histograms with custom buckets. So we're now turning every old classic style histogram into a native histogram. Um, and that's even better, right? We're on nearly 60% reduction in the message bytes on the wire, more than 70% better C uh, CPU time, and nearly 90% better in bytes allocated during the serialization. And I imagine some of you in the audience might be implementers of receivers, so you're probably wondering, well, what about deserialization? That's significantly better, right? Um, so es essentially, in all cases, we've improved the efficiency while being able to add new features. So what do you need to do in order to start using Remote Write 2.0? Uh, well, well, in Prometheus itself, it's uh, pretty easy. There's essentially just two lines you need to change. Uh, one is a command line flag, and that tells Prometheus to um, write metadata records to the write head log so the Remote Write can actually find them. Um, and then there's a new field that we've added to the remote write config itself, uh, which just tells Prometheus um, which version of the protobuf format to use. By default, it'll still use 1.0, but if you explicitly tell it to, it will use 2.0. <clears throat> um, we need as many uh, community projects and, and users to start adopting this as possible. Um, we're implementing new versions in client libraries to support sending um, remote write itself with like out having to use Prometheus. Um, we're working on some test frameworks like the one we used to benchmark ourselves. Uh, we've got compliance tests in the works, right? So um, for 1.0, these already exist. But if you wanted to say you're a vendor or you're going to be using a vendor and you want to check whether or not they're compliant with 2.0 uh, spec, that's in progress right now as well. Uh, and then within the ecosystem, we have a bunch of other tools as well that could help you test things. Um, there's one called Avalanche, which generates metrics. Um, you could use something like Casex to do load testing as well. Um, if you really want to, you can go digging around, sorry, digging around in the uh, repository for a protobuf. But actually, as part of this project, um, we've started, it's a little small on that screen, but we've started publishing all of Prometheus's protobuf specs uh, to buff, um, so you can get them there. Um, and Buff has tools to help you get up and running even faster, right? So for example, like you can use their tools, buff.build, to generate a Go client for a remote write. So in summary, <clears throat> remote write 2.0 enables this great set of features, features that Prometheus itself already supports, uh, while also making some pretty significant performance improvements, right? Uh, over 60% for almost every 
um, everything that we've measured. Um, it's pretty simple to configure, only two lines within Prometheus. Um, and if you're the owner of a third-party project or some kind of community tool, um, we invite you to implement RemoteWrite2.0 support. Come to us if you have questions, right? Um, it's technically still experimental, the spec. Um, we really don't anticipate any changes. Uh, I know I don't want to spend any time on more changes, right? But um, it's just listed as experimental because there's kind of historical precedent, right? Like, we only released a spec for 1.0 eight years after it really came out, right? Um, there's some areas we're thinking about making additional improvements. Um, uh, for example, going back to our compression algorithm investigations, um, should we use alternative proto formats like Cap and Proto or maybe something like Arrow? Uh, is there anything else we can do to improve the like transactionality of the protocol without having to be stateless? Uh, things like that, yeah. But that's, that's after 2.0, of course. That's right? after 2.0, yes, yeah. <clears throat> um, so like I said, if you have questions, you can obviously ask us now, but we're also in the CNCF Slack in a couple of channels. Uh, I also want to thank Alex and Nico, who helped us with a lot of the investigation and experimentation that we did. Um, Pascalis is the one who actually implemented metadata in Prometheus's write-ahead log. And then Uri and Arthur are involved in a lot of metadata created timestamp stuff. And then finally, the original uh, Prometheus Remote Write 1.0 authors. So Tom, Julius, and a few other people. Um, and obviously, thanks to all of you for coming. And we're going to open it up for questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Hi, thanks. That's great. Uh, a question for what would you say to a user who uh, has metrics collected in LTLP, maybe via SDKs, open telemetry SDKs, or the collector, and wants to send it to Prometheus? Uh, can they just use OTLP, uh, or is it still better to use remote write v2? What, what are the differences? That's a good question. So, Open Telemetry Collector usually, especially if you use Contrib and you add those proper exporters, they allow you to have both OTLP and Remote Write. We are working on Open Telemetry Collector to support 2.0, and I think our PR is open. And that's a good question, like because then you can because Prometheus also supports OTLP receiving. So, what's better? Um, honestly measure, <laughs> check it out. My impression is that uh, remote write is definitely faster at the moment, like more efficient. Um, that would what I would expect, but you know, OTLP is much more you know, feature rich, but of course that's not relevant for, for Prometheus data model right now. So I would say remote write, but um, of course that might change. We'll kind of like, we are collaborating with OTLP and, and kind of maybe helping them to kind of adopt some kind of string interning and stuff, stuff like that. So. Um, right now, um, yeah, that's my answer. Okay, cool. So, do mostly uh, performance? Uh, I would say so, yeah, because um, there is aspect of this uh, naming conventions, but uh, with free zero, you, it's all UTF-8 compatible, so you should have exactly the same namings. There might be difference around resource attributes, but um, you can do that on client side, hopefully with the with the with the sender. So they're kind of like, yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Is there a sense for when the community will start implementing this in some of the syncs like Mimir, Thanos, or Cortex? Yeah, um, I think, you know, in the next six months. Like, I literally will go to Thanos, and once we release all of this, we're busy. But now I, I will kind of, like, even my, like myself kind of try to like, do this work on Thanos' side, um, and then Cortex, and I think Grafana, maybe Callum knows more, but I would expect very soon. And, and by the way, this is the moment when, when those, you know, projects will adopt remote right, then we'll make it stable, because that would prove, you know, that this is really successful and, and, and good to go. And where's the best place to keep up to date on those efforts? Ah, that's a good point. Maybe blog, Prometheus blog. So Prometheus website for sure. Uh, we'll make sure to have a blog post when, when we are kind of ready with the stability and, and more adopters. And there's also the adopters page that, well, that's a good idea to kind of like make, make, make uh, up to date. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for your presentation. Um, what are the benefits and trade-offs of using a Prometheus agent with remote write versus using a centralized Prometheus to scrape hosts remotely? 
Um, I mean, the obvious one is you can't query the agent, right? So if that's a requirement for you, then obviously your decision is made. Um, I think the question was more, if I understood correctly, that you have either Prometheus in the same cluster and send further, or you have Prometheus actually in a remote cluster and scrape uh, remotely. Right. Um, <clears throat> eventually, it's just a question of scale in terms of how much resources you can throw at that single node centralized Prometheus, right? Um, like Bartek mentioned, the Prometheus project is never intended to solve for things like high availability or clustering or anything like that. Um, so eventually that centralized Prometheus will start to fall over. Um, I think internally we got up to one, maybe Mark can correct me, but I think internally we got to one that was up to like 100 gigs of RAM or something like that, higher. Um, but it, it, was, it was painful, right? Like it was, it was really a big pain point. Um, if you're smaller, then uh, for sure, a single centralized Prometheus, whether it's one that's scraping your various clusters and storing in one place, or if you've got an agent that's sending to it. Yeah. Yeah. And if your question is more around, OK, I can scale Prometheus or use other so, you know, uh, solutions, but still put them in centralized place um, instead of putting, you know, like, and scrape literally across, you know, scrape from different clusters. Um, then you have this question of reliability, that's all, right? So essentially, we recommend to putting or Prometheus or Open Therapy Collector or any scraper agent next to your applications because this is why, you know, it's so powerful because, you know, you have like a super nice uh, reliability when you know the scrape fail, you know it's likely application, it's not network, right? Which is, which is really, really common. And then you have an overhead of a pretty large amount of data that is, you know, really badly compressed because, again, those scrape protocols protocols are not optimized for what we know, uh, wide network kind of use. Um, so again, this is what we recommend, have smaller scrapers and then send that for remote ride uh, to, the, to the centralized storage if you need. Thank you. Hey, uh, you hinted at it for remote right for uh, failures and retries. If the back end's having trouble right now, we're building up a queue of remote write messages. Does the, the data you're getting back in the header that you showed of which ones failed help the queue be more optimal in knowing what it should try again? Um, so we, we kind of wanted to go all the way and solve that completely. Um, but unfortunately, that whole discussion was happening pretty late into um, finalizing the spec. So we added these headers to tell you whether or not all of the data was accepted. But we didn't go as far as saying which weren't accepted. Um, there's obviously a cost with doing that as well, right? Like how much data do we want to send back as part of a response? Um, so right now in the spec, we essentially require that if you want to retry, uh, the receiver must be fully idempotent for, for that request, right? Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. <coughs> Hi. Great presentation. I have a somewhat related question. Um, Sometimes we end up in situations where the write-ahead log is too big to be processed on startup by a remote writer. And I was wondering if you did any benchmarking or measuring the size of the wall and if it's faster or more efficient to process it on startup during crash scenarios like the one mentioned. Um, as part of this, we didn't measure that. Um, so yeah. it's unrelated. Essentially, it's very yeah. unrelated because yeah. uh, wall is used for many, many things than just... Uh, remote right, but definitely I wanted to share that we are kind of like redesigning wall for some of those features to go for remote right. For example, like native histogram with custom buckets and and create timestamp. There, there is some wall redesign, and this, as a part of this work, we'll definitely make it uh, try to make it much faster. But it's not not really necessarily related to remote right. Yeah, um, one of the the list of like other things that we want to do in the future, um, and this has been on the backlog for multiple years, is. Um, right now, when remote write restarts for any reason, uh, whether that's Prometheus restarting or you changing the config and reloading or something like that, uh, it just drops everything that hasn't been sent yet, right? It doesn't matter if it's buffered or if it's uh, seeked to a per certain point in the wall. When remote write restarts, it just goes to the recent, this is where I am now, right? Uh, what we'd like to have is this concept of like a remote write checkpoint. So remote write knows okay, when I restarted, I was on segment nine out of 10 in like roughly this place. I can restart from there. Um, that's the main idea we have right now for basically improving remote rights usage of the wall, even though technically we don't own it. Maybe there's something we can do with the agent mo mode, 
But within Prometheus itself, the TSDB and everybody who works on TSDB actually owns the write ad log. We've kind of just abused the fact that it's there, right? And reused it as an, like an on-disk buffer, almost. Yeah, and if you have like special requirements that we hear sometimes where your centralized storage is down for two days, for example, and you have that data kind of in Prometheus in the local storage, you know, remote write is obviously, and like not remote write as a protocol, but Prometheus use of remote write is limited to this two hour wall. Um, we are really thinking about kind of like having like this, uh, what, uh, yeah, bulk bulk up, upload or something where you upload blocks which are not there, or even use remote write from the old part. And this is especially useful for edge, you know, clusters. So if you have those needs, please go to Prometheus project, add an issue, uh, plus one the issue, so we know that it's it's kind of like important. But there are also some innovations that we are looking for on those side as well. Okay, I think we are just about the time, so you can uh, catch up later and see the next uh, to tomorrow on Thursday the session for Prometheus as well. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.